start off by looking at the periodic table and how the periodic table has changed over time. The first model of the periodic table uh, was developed by John Newland, who came up with the law of octaves. Uh, he arranged all the elements in terms of a cre increasing atomic mass. Um, and um, he noticed that kind of a pattern uh, was seen. Uh, every eight elements, they seem to react um, very similarly. Um, so you can see like here, fluorine and chlorine have been put in the same group because of the fact they react very similarly. Here's uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, all react very similarly with water. Um, however, you can see that there's definitely some mistakes, okay? And that's why a lot of scientists didn't agree with Newland's first model of the periodic table. Uh, actually, not many people believed it at all, uh, and not many people acknowledged his work for a long time after. One reason was because he put uh, two of the same elements in the same box, um, which is definitely a mistake. You can't do that. So he had two elements in the same box. Also, uh, some scientists didn't like the fact that um, you could see that in some uh, groups uh, there were things that did not fit the pattern. Okay, They did not fit the pattern. Copper, for example, was in the same group as uh, potassium, sodium and lithium. And copper is unreactive, whereas potassium, sodium and lithium are highly reactive. If you put them in water, uh, you can see quite a vigorous reaction, whereas copper did not fit that trend. He also mixed some metals and non-metals. An example is over here. He's put uh, nitrogen and uh, nitrogen has been put in the same uh, group as manganese, which is a non-metal. So as you can see, scientists would be uh, very not happy with uh, the, this period table because of the mistakes that they can clearly see. Um, Mandalay have rectified these mistakes in his version of the periodic table, okay? And the way he did that was by leaving gaps. He left gaps for undiscovered elements, okay? Um, basically, there were only a few elements discovered at the time, and he realised that there must be gaps uh, left because the elements must be undiscovered. There would be elements to fit that box, however, he left gaps for them and because of that a lot of scientists actually believed in him and he got a lot of support for his work now looking at the modern periodic table there's a few th key things that we need to know about our uh, periodic table we have groups going down and we have periods going across okay so for, for example uh, if we look at magnesium for example magnesium is in group two and it is in period three. Another key thing we need to notice about our periodic table is where it separates metals from non-metals. And what you can almost do is you can draw a little line uh, to separate the metals from non-metals. Uh, and everything on the right hand side <coughs> of this <coughs> line is a non-metal and everything on the left hand side is a uh, metal. Now, these elements that are kind of shaded in, um, those elements like boron and silicon, they actually show properties of both metals and non-metals, and they're called metalloids. There are some key groups in this periodic table that we're going to uh, examine in more detail in the screencast. Uh, some ones that you need to know is group zero or group eight, which is also known as the noble gases. You also need to know about group seven, which are known as the halogens. And you need to know about group one, which is the alkali metals. The first group that we're going to look at is group one, which is also known as the alkali metals. And there's some key things we need to know about this group. Um, first things first, as you go down the group, uh, the elements get more dense, okay? Uh, if you drop rubidium into water, it will actually sink. Uh, potassium, sodium and lithium will float on top of water. Um, you can see that all of them are very shiny. Um, they're all shiny when cut. But if you take a, an alkali metal just straight out of oil, they're all stored under oil because they react very vigorously with water. 
um, if you take them out of it, it often they're not um, so shiny when you first take them out. You have to cut them because of the fact the outer layer will react with oxygen and make uh, the metal oxide. You'll see sodium oxide or lithium oxide around the outside of the alkaline metal. Um, so as well as getting more dense down the group, uh, the melting and boiling point decreases down the group. Melting point and boiling point decreases down the group. So uh, lithium will have a higher melting point and boiling point than cesium, rubidium, francium, and so on. Um, and the last trend you need to know about is the reactivity. So the reactivity increases down the group. You might have seen in the laboratory at schools that you have that lithium fizzes and so does sodium. However, purple, um, a purple flame develops when you put potassium in water. And you might have seen on YouTube when rubidium and cesium get added to water and you get big explosions. I've seen people put them in bathtubs. Uh, I don't advise any of this, but they put them in bathtubs and it completely blows it to shreds. Now, the reason for such vigorous reactions uh, is to kind of look at the products that it's making. Um, it makes one of the products is hydrogen. And hydrogen is an incredibly flammable gas. Uh, you can actually test for hydrogen using a squeaky pop test um, where you put a lit splint inside a test tube of hydrogen and it will make a squeaky pop. And the other um, product is the metal hydroxide. Um, metal hydroxide is alkaline, so you can test for that as well using universal indicator, and that will go purple in the presence of a metal hydroxide. The next group to look at is perhaps my favourite uh, group in the periodic table. It's group seven and the halogens. Uh, the halogens um, are very interesting. Uh, they're often highly toxic. Um, they also have distinct colours. Um, they get a lot darker as you go down the group. Uh, so you start off with um, fluorine, which is a pale yellow gas and you get to chlorine which is in this test tube here which is um green you've got bromine which is kind of like an orangey brown liquid you've got iodine which is a brown solid and then you get astatine which is almost black so they get dark down the group you might have also heard um that they get a uh, higher boiling point and melting point as well down the group um and you can kind of tell that by when I said like bromine's a liquid and iodine's a solid that the boiling point and melting point must be increasing down the group. Um, now there's other another observation that you um, that's different to group one, uh, and that's the fact that the reactivity increases up this group. Now I'm going to explain why that happens now, and also why. Uh, in group one, uh, the opposite trend is observed. I said I'd go over the trends uh, and why you observe the fact that down group one, they get more reactive and um, down group seven, they get less reactive. And they're both attributed to the same cause called shielding. And it's easiest to show you what shielding is by drawing out the electron configurations of um both group one elements and group seven. So here I've got uh, the group one elements, lithium and sodium, and I have the group F, uh, group seven elements, fluorine and chlorine. As you might remember from C1, the atomic structure, you, you need to remember that the nucleus is positive um, and that the electrons around the outside are negative. Now, when um, sodium and lithium react, okay what happens is they lose that outer electron they're trying to get rid of that they really want to get rid of that so that they get a full outer shell um now it's easier to do that the further away the electron is from the positive nucleus think about it like a fire if you are 
standing really close to that fire, you're going to feel its effect more. You're going to feel really hot. However, if you're further away, you're going to feel its effect much less. And it's just like that with these electrons. The electrons are negative, so they're naturally attracted to the positive nucleus. Okay. Now, the ones that are closer, they feel this effect much more. And this effect is called shielding. They feel, they feel the effect much more, and they're held a lot tighter to the nucleus. However, the further away they are, the more likely that an electron can go wandering and leave. So, um, the reason for the, the increasing reactivity is electrons are further from the nucleus, and they feel the positive effect less and therefore uh, that they can lose an electron more easily so why does group 7 not follow this pattern well the reason why group 7 doesn't follow because fluorine and chlorine aren't looking to lose an electron they're looking to gain electrons okay they're looking to gain an electron and just go back to the fire incident so th there's a positive nucleus isn't it okay and um it's trying to uh, pull in more electrons it's trying to get more electrons attracted to it so you're going to feel it more the closer to it you are okay so um to summarize uh the, cl the closer the electrons are to the nucleus the easier it is to attract another electron and that is shielding uh, now you know um, why halogens are more or less reactive we can look at a property of halogens uh, in the fact that they can displace one another one another from compounds down here i've got a reaction which shows uh, this property i've got potassium bromide being added to fluorine making potassium fluoride and bromine and basically why that happens is fluorine is uh, more reactive uh, than bromine so it has displaced the bromine from its solution now how might you know that this has happened uh, you would see a color change uh, when bromine is produced, you looked at when we looked at halogens, we said uh, bromine is kind of like a brownie liquid. Uh, you'd see that this solution would go brown because of the fact um, bromine has been produced. Now, you've seen what happens when you add a more reactive halogen to a less reactive halide complex. Uh, but what happens if I was to swap them round? Would, would, would I try to do this 2KF plus uh, Br2? Well, that reaction could never take place because of the fact bromine is less reactive than fluorine, so it will not displace it from uh, its compounds. Now, if you're struggling to think how this is happening and why it happens, I like to kind of think of uh, halogens like contestants in Love Island, okay? Now, in Love Island, you want to be paired up, don't you? You want to be in a couple. Well, it's just the same with halogens, okay? They like being paired up and coupled. They want to be... Uh, part of a complex and um, the more reactive ones will displace the less reactive ones from the solution in just like in Love Island where maybe you say that the better looking people uh, will displace the less better the less good looking people from their couple that they're in Another group that we need to know about is uh, the noble gases the noble gases are found in group zero of our periodic table or group eight um, and it took ages for them to be discovered because of the fact they are very unreactive or another word for unreactive 
is inert, okay? So it took ages for them to be discovered. And the reason why they're so unreactive is if we look at the electron configuration of neon over here, they have completely full outer shells. This means that they don't have to lose or gain electrons um, to create this full outer shell. And uh, a lot of elements in the periodic table that aren't in group zero, they want to get this full outer shell because it's the most stable configuration uh, for the elements. One more thing you need to know about group zero um, is the fact that the boiling point increases as you go down the group. If you're doing combined science, you can stop there. However, if you're doing triple science, uh, then you need to also know about the transition metals as well. And the transition metals are found in this section of the periodic table between group two and group three of your periodic table. Um, now, some cool things about the transition metals is they are often used as catalysts. Uh, and because of this, uh, they are very important in industry. They are also very expensive uh, often and also sometimes quite rare, okay? Uh, think about platinum, uh, gold, elements like that. They're, they're very rare and expensive um, metals. Also with transition metals, they can have varying oxidation states uh, and that can change the property of the compound. Um, now, if we look over here, uh, we've looked at ions, uh, so you, you'll know something about this already. Uh, you can also, with um, transition metals, you can have elements uh, that have that are completely the same, however, have uh, different ions. Okay, so this is chromium, for example. Chromium can be found in two plus or three plus state. Now, the main thing this usually changes is the color of uh, that transition metal. Also, um, it can change some of the properties in, in how it reacts. And with finishing the transition metals, we have finished the whole of the topic of the periodic table. Hopefully you have enjoyed this video.